It's the month of March, and we're about to fill an hour-long show talking about college football and exclusively college football as we do here every single day on the On3 YouTube channel. Welcome into the Hard Count, baby. It is Tuesday, March 26th, 2024, the last one on the face of the planet, so we're going to make it the very best in the history of the planet. Glad to have you all dialed in, man. Got a lot to jump into. Who's feeling the pressure this season in college football? There's some obvious ones that we're going to get to here. Maybe some less obvious ones that I think we need to address together as well. In addition to that, man, Lincoln Riley, if you had your head on a swivel this past weekend, USC and company, they were on an absolute heater when it came to what they did on the recruiting trail. And I think that deserves a little more attention than it's getting right now. And on top of that, I think there deserves to be more conversation around the context with Lincoln Riley. Because after this past season, everyone saw what USC didn't do well and saw Caleb Williams and how he didn't win the national championship and didn't repeat as a Heisman Trophy winner. And everyone just totally pinned that on Lincoln Riley and said he's a bad coach. Which, for those of us that have kept a little bit of a log of college football over the course of the last five years, we understand that's not really a fair statement. Are there some things they can improve on? Sure, but we'll talk about that here when we get to that point in the segment. Unpopular takes. They are back. They are back in a very real way. I had one of you throw me an unpopular take, and you said that you think Texas could win a national championship in 2024. In fact, that wasn't the way that you described it. You said you think Texas will win a national championship in 2024. Their first year in the SEC, kicking down the door, taking names. We love to see it. We'll talk about that. We'll give you our thoughts on that take. We appreciate you being so bold to bring it to the table. Deion Sanders and company. Been in the news a little bit lately, a couple of headlines. Deion Sanders making his thoughts known around Shadour Sanders and Travis Hunter and what they're going to do when they get to the NFL draft and where they could go and where they might not go. Shadour Sanders calling out uh, an entire classification of Texas high school football. More power to him. What are our thoughts on Colorado ahead of 2024? I don't really have a huge issue with what they said, spoiler alert, but I think there's more to be talked about with Colorado. Spring propaganda. It's that time of year. What are some things that you enjoy to partake in when it comes to spring propaganda? You know, one of my favorites before we get to that segment is, uh, hey, your quarterback, man, he's spinning it. Your quarterback's having arguably the best spring of anybody in the entire country. Hey, he looks night and day different from last year. It's that time of year. It's propaganda season. We'll give you uh, some of our favorite spring propaganda that we like to take part in. If you're watching this show, we freaking love you. We freaking appreciate you taking time out of your day, out of your morning to hang out with us and talk about the greatest sport in the history of this world. All right, so whatever you got going on right now, we're glad to be a part of it. Kind of take a break from everything else going on mentally. This is a mental vacation. We're talking ball and only ball here for the next hour or so. Again, we're very grateful to have you all a part of this thing as we jump head first into it. Who's under the most pressure in college football in 2024? There's some obvious ones. There's some, least, uh, some, some less obvious ones. But one of the more obvious ones we got to talk about here is Ryan Day at Ohio State. Now, there's always pressure at Ohio State because of that logo. Like, as long as you're the head coach there, the expectation is clear as day. Beat Michigan, win a national championship, something they haven't done here the last couple of seasons. But there's added pressure in the fact that they've made some really big moves this offseason. Like the old, uh, old Peter Parker protocol. With great power comes great responsibility. With great talent on your roster, with big ads on your coaching staff comes great expectations. And that's kind of the thing with Ryan Day. I don't know that we talk enough about how he's embracing the pressure. Because as tough a job as Ohio State it is, we've never once heard rumblings of, Ryan Day, is he going to make the jump to the NFL? Is Ryan Day, does he want to stay at Ohio State? Like, he's gone through it the last couple of years with how that fan base has been unhappy with what they haven't done on the field. And the fact that Michigan won a national championship kind of sprinkles some more juice to that whole conversation. But I think we got to applaud Ryan Day for the moves he made this past offseason. Mostly because there really wasn't a major catalyst, internally at least, to force him to make those moves. Like, he didn't have to go out and grab Will Howard through the transfer portal. He very easily could have said, all right, Kyle McCord, come back for another year. Get another year of experience under your belt have a better year in 2024. And he might have done just that. He, he very well could have improved upon his 2023 campaign if he had been guaranteed the job to come back. Ryan Day didn't do that. Ryan Day sat down with him, it sounds like, 
had a transparent conversation. Cal McCord ends up transferring to Syracuse. Ryan Day could have also kept calling plays. It would have been very easy for Ryan Day to say, listen, this is what I do. I am a play caller. I'm an offensive guru. That's how I came up in this game. That's how we're going to go out. If we lose, it'll be on my terms. And guess what? Nobody would have faulted Ryan Day for doing that. But he says, listen, I think we can get better with me as a CEO. I'm going to go out and hire an OC. Ended up hiring two OCs with Bill O'Brien being the first revolution of that. And he goes and takes the job at Boston College. And then he goes and hires a head coach from the same conference in Chip Kelly. Obviously coming over from UCLA, who has a ton of skins on the wall. Nobody was forcing him to do that. Nobody was forcing him to go hire a big-name OC. He did that. Also, he didn't need to add a running back like Quinshawn Judkins with how stacked that room is. Travian Henderson coming back. Dallin Hayden, who's a dog. We've seen him in a couple occasions out there in Columbus. He's going to be a player for them. Goes out and adds Quinshawn Judkins. For a lot of people's money, one of the best backs in the entire country. Didn't need to go add Caleb Downs. You see where I'm going with this? He had a top 10 defense pretty much coming back. Didn't need to go and add the top player in the transfer portal. Ohio State, very aggressive in bringing Caleb Downs to Columbus. So that, the, the thing I want to say here, again, Ryan Day, every move he's made here, he didn't have to make these moves. He made these moves because he's embracing the pressure and the standard that comes with being the head coach at Ohio State. And the pressure around him, I think, is very much so tied to the expectations and the pressure to perform and all that. But like, just so we're on the same page, I think the hot seat talk around him is just absolutely irresponsible. I think it's ridiculous. Like To, to say that Ryan Day isn't one of the best coaches in college football. I think you're way off base there. We had him in our top five, I believe, going into this season, or coming out of this season, rather, when it comes to the top coaches in the sport. Like, I think it's also worth noting that the Ryan Day Ohio State we saw last season is not the same Ohio State that we saw previously when he first got the job. And what I mean by that is when Ohio State got absolutely drugged at home by Oregon, and Oregon ran for pretty much however many yards they wanted to on the ground, we saw a very quick pivot from, from Ryan Day. We saw him say, we got to make changes defensively, goes out and hires Jim Knowles that following offseason. Like, he's acted very quickly to remedy the issue. So I don't want to spend too much time here on Ryan Day, but, like, the thought that he's going to stay the same as a head coach in the next couple of seasons at Ohio State and what they are right now, like, they're continuing to progress, continuing to evolve. And if for no other reason, if I'm an Ohio State Buckeye fan, the progress and the trend that I've seen, maybe not just yet on the field, but the trend that you've seen within this roster, I think should be reason to be excited about the future in Columbus. But even with that being said, the roster, the staff, the missed expectations, and the brand itself, obviously a lot of pressure at Ohio State. Now, here's one that I don't think is going to get talked about quite enough when it comes to the pressure cooker in college football in 2024. Nico Iamaliava, I think, has a lot of pressure on him this upcoming season. And the pressure, I think, for him is wrapped in the wrapping paper that is expectations because he's the number one player from the class of 2023. For him, pressure is privilege. Also, you couple in the fact that he is rumored to be that $8 million recruit. So there's some folks that are thinking, all right, if that is true, if he was, you know, given that sum of money to come and be quarterback here, want to see some return on investment. So there's that whole deal to go with it. Also, this narrative that's kind of been baking for a while of like, hey, wait till Nico plays. Like, right? That, that's the way that you felt in Knoxville. Even the duration of last season when Joe Milton was good, maybe not what you had hoped he would be as quarterback for you last season. The thought was always, well, hey, well, Nico gets playing. Wait till he hits the field. We're going to be a different ball club. That's been the narrative that you've been feeding yourself for the last couple of years, really since he committed to Tennessee. That's now going to actually come to fruition this upcoming year. You're going to actually get to see that narrative on the field. So when that's the, the thought around Nico, again, it's, it's not so much just he's going to be really good. right? Like that, that's not just the expectation with him. The expectation is that he is good enough to separate Tennessee from where they are right now and push them into that tier one level in the SEC. That he is the equalizer for you, where maybe you don't have the same recruiting classes over the course of the last couple of years that Georgia's had, that Alabama's had, heck, even the LSU has had, haven't lived in that top 10. But Nico Iamaliava is good enough, is talented enough to push your roster into that top tier level within the conference. That's a lot of pressure on a kid. It's a lot of pressure on a kid who is going to make his first full season as the guy starting at quarterback for Tennessee. 
So what I would say with him, the expectations and all that, like, again, it's privilege. It's pressure for him for sure, but I think it is privilege with how talented he is and the, the high-profile recruit that he is coming to Tennessee. I think we need to allow some margin and some fluidity with our opinion around Nico over the course of his career in Knoxville. Because there's a lot of people now, especially after that bowl game where he lit up a pretty good Iowa defense, they're going to say, well, if he doesn't win the Heisman Trophy his first year, or they don't beat Georgia or whatever, like if they don't accomplish tier one accolades his first season there, they're going to say, ah, is he really that good? Ah, is he worth the $8 million supposedly throwing at him? Oh, is he like there's going to be so much compensating and so many just opinions that are out there that are made in a couple of games sample size. Let's allow for some nuance here that maybe what you get game one from Nico won't be the same thing you get from him over the course of the next couple of seasons as he gets more comfortable in the offense, as he gets more comfortable as a college quarterback. So pressure's priv- pressure is privilege, uh, but there's massive expectations on young Nico his first year in Tennessee. Now here's an a individual that I think we need to talk about where I would say the pressure is actually pretty fair when it comes to the conversation around them in 2024. Because the Ryan Day pressure is pretty consistent. It's going to be there. The Nico pressure, you get it because of how high profile he is. The pressure around Dabo Sweeney, I think, is extremely, extremely fair. And this is not me saying negative things about Dabo Sweeney or being down on Clemson. In fact, the opposite. I think what he's created there is admirable. I think the culture he's created there is second to none. But at the exact same time, there is pressure for him to push Clemson back to their standard when it comes to how they've done in the win and loss column, to just call a spade a spade. Because there was a six-year run there where Clemson was just living in the college football playoff. That was who they were. Death, taxes, and Dabo Sweeney and company playing on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day whenever that college football playoff semifinal was. That was a guarantee, pretty much, it felt like. Now, with the way that college football has evolved... NIL becoming a factor, the transfer portal becoming a factor, and Clemson not really embracing the transfer portal side of things, you're seeing other teams within the ACC start to pass Clemson, right? Like Florida State. We were there last year in in Death Valley where Florida State had transfer portal player after transfer portal player make a game-changing play that allowed Florida State to ultimately win that football game. Clemson, if they had had a Keon Coleman on their roster that day, probably would have won the game. Miami, same deal. They go to the portal. They beef up the offensive line. They make a couple of key additions on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. And it wasn't necessarily those players making the play to beat Clemson, but Miami, in a lot of ways you could say, is starting to pass or at least get even with Clemson. And so I keep saying this, and for those of y'all that have tuned into this show for any period of time, you, you, you've already heard me say this, so hang tight. I really think that the way that you evaluate Chick-fil-A is the same way you evaluate Clemson. Chick-fil-A, they do things their own way. They're closed on Sundays. They only serve one style of food. It's, it's chicken. Maybe they do grilled chicken. You get a sausage biscuit if you're there early. But like Chick-fil-A, you're okay with them being closed on Sunday because they give you the best product out there. Clemson, you were okay with them not going to the portal. You were okay with them kind of operating different on the recruiting trail because they were living in the college football playoff. Well, that's not the case anymore. There's pressure on Dabo Sweeney and his way of doing things to yield results that they used to yield. Last thing I'll say here, I get a little bit irritated when I hear Dabo Sweeney speak about the fan base and their their discomfort with how Clemson has played on the field. Because he says, listen, when I got here, Clemson, we weren't this, we weren't that. And it's like, yeah, that's true. Like Clemson wasn't nearly as successful as they were until you got there. But you are there now and you have set the standard there now and there is expectations now. So just because 8-4 and four used to be good enough, after you made the college football playoff six times in a row, it's no longer good enough. Can we all agree that's fair to say? So real pressure on Dabo Sweeney and Clemson to get back to the college football playoff, especially with it expanding, and that'll be one to watch for sure. Now here's another obvious one, Billy Napier. 11-14 and 14 over his time uh, in Gainesville so far. I've been very vocal. I think the context around his job in Gainesville – is absolutely massive. Didn't take over a winning organization. Took it over in the most difficult conference in the you know that is the SEC. So I just I think that needs to be talked about. But the the truth of the matter is, however you feel about what's going to happen after the season with Billy Napier, and there's a lot of I think differing opinions. It is a show me something year. Like you've had the last two years, you had a generational talent in Anthony Richardson who you kind of got up to speed and won six ball games. Okay, it's year one. Last year, 
went to the portal, got a quarterback, woulda, shoulda, coulda in a couple games, go 5-7. and seven. This is the year where it's like, hey, show me that this thing is heading a certain direction. Like last year is last year. I think a lot of people, if they were paying attention to the way that Florida was trending going into the year, kind of saw, all right, making a bowl game is probably about where we should land. If you get to seven wins, that's great. They were two plays away from winning seven ball games. It is what it is. But the deal with Billy Napier is like, okay, we need to know that we're headed a certain direction, that we're going to eventually arrive somewhere. And I've said it a couple times. I think eight wins is probably where you would like to find yourself at if you're Florida. Again, that's in an ideal world. We'll see how it, how it all works out. But, like, the thing that has to be said here is the direct competitors in the state of Florida that Florida's up against on the recruiting side of things are gaining more and more ammunition to recruit against Florida. Like, if I'm a Miami, I'm a Florida State, I'm a UCF, I'm saying, don't go to Florida. Is your head coach going to be there? Like, that's the, the thing that I think coaches are saying now. And I don't know that to be true 100%, but I have to imagine that's at least a thought for recruits when they talk about Florida. So there's definitely some pressure to kind of show there's a direction, show there's a trend, and also for Florida State and Miami and, and UCF, I feel like there's a, a very clear arrow pointing up at those schools. So we'll see what happens there, but definitely some pressure on Billy Napier. A couple more to get to here. Jalen Milrow. I think he's got some, uh, some very real pressure on his shoulders this year. And he doesn't have pressure in the sense that he has to prove that he can play college football at a high level. I think some people question that coming into this season. It is what it is. He has some very real skins on the wall. SEC champ, got him to the college football playoff. There's going to be a couple of things that are different from last year to this year for Jalen Milrow. And that's pretty straightforward. New head coach, no longer the shield of Nick Saban. Now it's Kalen DeBoer. But the thing that I think uh, needs to get some, some conversation when it comes to Jalen Milrow and the pressure he's going to have on himself in 2024 is if anything goes wrong, I think folks will be very quick to point the finger at Jalen Milrow. And that sort of comes with the deal when you play quarterback. But I mean, more specifically, they're going to be slow to say it's Kalen DeBoer's fault because people just saw Kalen DeBoer play for a national championship. People just saw Kalen DeBoer with Michael Penix Jr. have massive success offensively. So if that offense under Jalen Milrow doesn't thrive, they're going to say, well, we know Kalen DeBoer can coach offense. We know Kalen DeBoer with the right quarterback can score a lot of points. What's wrong with Jalen Milrow? And there's already kind of that thought, too, of like, hey, is, is he a consistent passer? I think that's a fair question to have right now if you're a college football fan or an Alabama fan, period. We see y'all in the comment section, and we appreciate y'all adding to the conversation. That's a question a lot of y'all have. The offense, I think, will hopefully adapt to Jalen Milrow, but to the same token, I think there is going to be some new things asked of him. Kalen DeBoer, offensively, even though it was Ryan Grubb calling the plays, has averaged north of 40 attempts a game for his quarterbacks. Pretty straightforward. Like They, they want to throw the football more than Alabama did last year. They threw the football 23 times a game in 2023. So, have to adapt. There'll be a lot of weight on his shoulders, fair or unfair. There's going to be a lot of pressure on Jalen Milrow and just full transparency. I think he's a dude. I think he's going to be able to adapt. I think Alabama will have success with him running the show at quarterback. I think he is your guy, undoubtedly. But 9-3 and three out there, they're unhappy. 9-3 and three is not good enough for the folks in Tuscaloosa. God bless them. So, a lot of pressure on Jalen Milrow. All right, one more thing to get to here. And this was, uh, this was a tweet from that man, Josh Newberg, when I posted this question on Twitter. Another reason to be following, at J.D. Pickell. Said, who's, got the, or who's, who's facing, rather, the most pressure in college football in 2024? And Josh Newberg quoted it with the EA Sports logo. And that was where the light bulb sort of went on for me. I was like, Josh is absolutely right. And I think that tweet's at something like 10,000 likes, so y'all agree with Josh as well. EA Sports has so much pressure with college football 25 about to come out here in the summer. Now, I think it's this summer if we're, if we're kind of trying to gauge where it will come out because that's where it's come out previously, right before the season, so you would hope it comes out in the summer. There's pressure in that, too, to get a, to get a release date out to us as junkies. But the reason why there's so much pressure on EA Sports is because you have a bunch of starved individuals that for a long time, this game was a part of their calendar year in the sense that college football the season ends they live vicariously through that game for the better part of however many months until we get to spring football and until we get to week one and that was our vice that that was kind of how we did things there's also so many memories tied to this game to where as as the 
time passes from the last time this game was out, the memory and the legend and the lure of it all starts to grow. And so now, like, the game might have been a certain way when it first came out, but I promise you, in our minds, it's like the greatest thing that our thumbs have ever touched a controller to play. Like, that's kind of the, the standard and the expectation there. So when it comes to pressure, I don't know that it is fair for EA Sports, but they've done it to themselves because we haven't had the game in over a decade now. There are kids that have grown up playing video games, not even knowing what college football 25 the video game is or college football 14, NCAA 14 the video game was. So there's pressure on EA Sports. No way around it. But regardless, there's enough pressure to go around in 2024 for the college football season. So let me know who y'all think is facing pressure in 2024. But that's our short list of some individuals, coaches, players, companies alike that are uh, feeling the pressure a little bit. Feeling the pressure a little bit. It's kind of the way that it goes. Hey, if you're watching live right now, do me a favor. Make sure you're subscribed to the Anthro YouTube channel. I'm talking college football every single day. We uh, got a little field trip lined up for us here in the near future. Thursday, we're hitting the road, going in to uh, see a certain school in the SEC, watch some spring ball, sit down with the coach. So if you want to know who that's going to be, make sure you're following on the social channels at J.D. Pakel, Twitter, Instagram, and also just make sure you're subscribed here. That's going to be a great way to know what's going on. Speaking of what's going on, man, Lincoln Riley and USC, on the recruiting trail, man, they have got it going on. I mean, there's, there's no way around it. He was on an absolute heater, and USC was on an absolute heater as a staff. Probably credit that defensive staff quite a bit, too, with Dan Lynn and Eric Henderson. They landed not one, not two, not three, but four commitments in the class of 2025. Got one more in the class of 2026. On Sunday, massive visit weekend in Los Angeles, and they were all on the defensive side of the ball. Mic drop. Because remember, Lincoln Riley now doesn't do defense. They don't coach great defense at USC. They underachieve. That's kind of the, the thorn in the side. Just landed a bunch of really high-profile players, probably most notably five-star defensive lineman Justice Terry. Class of 2025 from the state of Georgia, flipped from the dogs to USC. Any way you slice it, that's massive for the Trojans to land a player of his caliber and to get it from the in-state school who was committed to the in-state school, like, no, in any way you slice it, that's massive. But the, way, the further we got into this whole thought around Lincoln Riley and USC, I think we started to peel back more layers and more narratives around him as a coach. And it sort of led me to this place where I'm like, I think we need to talk about this as a community right now. I think we need to provide some more context with who Lincoln Riley is as a head coach and what he hasn't accomplished in relation to what he has accomplished. Because there's this narrative out there like, all right, you landed some great talent on defense. Cool. It's not going to translate, though. And then when those people that say it won't translate or USC won't be good defensively, you say, well, what makes you feel that way? Because it's good to have dialogue. That's why we enjoy college football. The beauty is in the banter, as some would say. It won't translate because it's USC. Because it's USC. Because, like, the logo? Well, yeah, I mean, the last couple of years, like, USC and Lincoln Riley, they don't, they don't really play good defense. Look at Lincoln Riley and his track record, man. He hasn't coached good defense since he was at Oklahoma. That's where you got to stop. And tell your boy, like, hey, yeah, Lincoln Riley, as the head coach, hasn't had great defenses. But does Lincoln Riley coach up how to tackle? Does Lincoln Riley sit down during the week with the defense in the team meeting room with the, you know, the cowboy laser pointer and say, okay, what are we doing here? Hey, what, you missed your gap here. Lincoln Riley doesn't coach the defense. The issue for Lincoln Riley and for USC, I think it's pretty fair to say, and we'll see how much of an impact it had organizationally, was probably a philosophical thing and also probably a thing with who he had run the defense previously. Now, you're bringing a brand new staff, and we talked to him about it actually on this very show, so go check that uh, interview out on our YouTube channel. Made a point to hire with a high pedigree, guys that have coached in the NFL, guys that have coached on the defensive line, with Eric Henderson coming from the Rams, Danton Lynn, who's coached in the NFL, and also most recently coached a really good defense at UCLA across the road from USC. They've made a very clear point to hire with, again, high pedigree and also uh, an, an emphasis on development. Like Lincoln Riley said that to us, plain as day. We want to develop our guys and let the guys know that when they get here, they'll get developed. That's a very different tune than I think USC was singing previously because they had acquired some talent through the portal, and that's kind of the reason why you have folks being naysayers about USC. But again, it was an organizational thing. It wasn't Lincoln Riley per se. I mean, we're going to see how much of a 
pivot these hires make for his defense. But I think the narrative that it's Lincoln Riley and his defense, Lincoln Riley's not coaching defense. Now, it's his defensive coordinator. It's his organization, which he obviously is responsible for. But I think when you talk about Lincoln Riley as a coach, there's sort of become this narrative that he's like not a good coach because of how they underachieved last year and went 7-5 to five with the Heisman Trophy winner. And I get that. Like, in the moment, that's fair. That's fair to say that USC should have been massively better last year. Heck, we sat here in August of last year and picked them to make the college football playoff and to win the Pac-12. Rest in peace, Pac-12. We miss you already. Like, we, we were all the way on board with that. However, you look at what he's done over the course of his career, and as bad as the defenses have been, that was the first time in a regular season, I say regular season in the sense of we're not counting the COVID season where they went 9-2, and two, he's won double-digit games every other season. What does that tell you? Okay, he can coach some ball. What he's done with the quarterback position deserves some recognition. Multiple Heisman Trophy winners plus Jalen Hurts. He can coach some ball. Two college football playoff appearances. 80% of his games he has won as a head coach. He can coach some ball. So, yes, the defense has been bad. But if you're telling me that's the only issue and they're still able to win double-digit games pretty much every single year, are we really going to say he's a bad head coach? He's done a poor job managing the defensive side of the football. There's no way around that. But are you telling me he's a bad head coach? That feels a little bit irresponsible to me. And I think it should feel a little bit irresponsible to you as well when it comes to how we assess him as a head coach. Now, here's the other thing I want to make sure we talk about. There's so much thought around Lincoln Riley and what he's not able to do and and how he's not going to win a national championship because of what he doesn't do defensively. And it's like great head coaches are able to evolve. I think the next evolution for him is this defensive staff. And he didn't do it probably as quickly as you would have liked. You would have liked for him to evolve and be able to have a great defense to go with Kyler Murray or have a great defense to go with Jalen Hurts or a great defense this last year to go with Caleb Williams. Like, of course you would have liked to see that. But, like, if this is what it takes for him to evolve is having a fall-on-your-face kind of year in 2023 and they go win a national championship and you know over the course of the next three years, get one of those, who cares? <laughs> who cares? Like, it, it, it is very difficult to win a national championship. Only one team does it a year. Only one. And it took Dabo Sweeney at Clemson six years to figure it out. Took Kirby Smart six years for him to go win a national championship. There's a lot of things that have to fall into place. But I don't think it's a stretch to say that Lincoln Riley has had a college football playoff slash national championship level offense over the course of his entire coaching career. I don't think that's irresponsible to say. So if that's the one ingredient we have to fix okay, maybe there's a little bit more opportunity there than we're trying to realize. Also, for the record, talked about Dabo Sweeney and Kirby Smart taking them six years to win a national championship. I believe Lincoln Riley is on year seven or eight now as a head coach. So the bottom line here, you'd like to see him pivot quicker. But if this is the staff that changes the defensive side of the ball for USC and they acquire talent, how they've acquired talent over the course of this last weekend, it's early in 2025, top three class in the country right now. I would just keep tabs on USC, and I'd be very slow to make a definitive opinion on this new staff out there in Los Angeles. Speaking of uh, some newness, we got a new season in 2024, and I asked y'all via my Twitter page, I said, what is your most unpopular college football take that you strongly believe in? Like, you walk into the party or you text the group chat, you fire off this take, and like, you just... (laughs) You know what it's about to be. You know there's about to be smoke to go around for your opinion on this. And JJ got at us on Twitter, and he says, Texas will win the national championship in 2024. JJ stepping into the ring. Also, JJ, it's worth noting, has a Michigan logo for his profile picture on on Twitter. So more power to JJ. Make sure you subscribe. College football every single day. It's a college football community. By nature of this segment we're doing right now, we want you all a part of it. Being a part of it includes being subscribed. And then follow me on the socials at J.D. Pakel on Instagram and on Twitter. So what would it take for Texas to win a national title in 2024? You know, I, I don't think it's wildly outrageous to assume it's possible. I think the first ingredient you're looking at is Quinn Ewer staying healthy, something he hasn't done just yet in Austin. And then you also see him probably take another massive step as QB1 in Austin. Now, last year's numbers, again, he wasn't healthy the entirety of the season, but he threw for 3,400-plus yards, 22 touchdowns, six picks, 
completed 69% of his passes. That completion percentage number really encourages me because it means he knows where he's going with the football. He's putting it there on time and in the right spot by nature of having a high completion percentage. So that's encouraging. Now, if you're going to make the jump to being a national title kind of quarterback, I think you probably have those numbers somewhere in the range of 3,700, 3,800 yards. I want to see probably 35 touchdowns. And I want to see somewhere in the range of five interceptions or less keep that completion percentage number about where it is. If he's able to do that, that means that he was able to take another step in the offense by nature of what I just said. And the offense is scoring at a really high clip. Because as, as much as the SEC is going to be brutal defensively for Texas and how they're going to have to stack up in the trenches, we'll talk about that in a second, you have to keep your fastball your fastball if you're Texas this upcoming season. And the fastball is going to have to be Quinn Ewers. He has to level up his game with the departure of an Adonai Mitchell and an Xavier Worthy, who accounted for darn near 2,000 yards receiving between the two of them. That's the other part of this. The weapons you got through the portal have to hit the ground running. Hit the ground running, because here's the thing. You don't have a, a super big acclimation period to work with outside of spring football. Uh, you play Michigan at Michigan week two. Now, to be clear, you can drop that one and still make the college football playoff and accomplish all you want to accomplish, but you'd like to be able to have that be a confidence-building game. Okay, kind of have it be what Bama was this past year for you. Light the fuse, create the belief, we're off and running, let's go. The key thing here that I'm looking at is the ability for Texas to reload in the trenches defensively. Because listen now, Quinn Ewers got a lot of love, and he should. Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Weather got a lot of love. They scored a lot of points, and that should absolutely get a ton of the headlines. But I think Texas was a force last year because even with Quinn Ewers out of the lineup, that defense was stingy, and they were stingy at the defensive tackle spots. You had not one but two All-Americans lining up for you. Tavondre Sweat, Byron Murphy. They're both gone to the lead to get a paycheck. God bless them for it. As a defense last year, Texas allowed 2.9 yards a carry, one of the best averages in the country. They're going to ask some more now of these new individuals going to be playing more snaps. Alfred Collins, an older guy. They're going to ask more of him. Sidir Mitchell, going to ask more of him. So if the defensive line can keep some continuity with the output they got last year on that side of the football, and the offense does what I just told you it needs to do, and Quinn Ewers takes that next step and stays healthy, I think we have to reevaluate how we talk about Steve Sarkeesian. Because right now the narrative around Steve Sarkeesian is great offensive mind, Really good head coach, no way around it, but great offensive mind, great play caller, quarterback whisperer. That's why Arch Manning came to Texas. But if they win the national championship and do what I just said they could potentially do with how they would reload on the line of scrimmage defensively and how they could have those weapons translate, we talk about Sark as a great builder. I'm not just talking about builder from like a culture perspective. I'm talking about from a roster perspective. To be able to go to the portal, and to develop the guys already on their roster and put them in position to be successful to a national title level, that's not just play calling. That is CEO. That is modern college football 101. Retool your roster and go win yourself a natty. Like We change the way we talk about Steve Sarkeesian from a macro level if they get that done in 2024. Now, speaking of macro level, man, think about what this would do for Texas on the recruiting trail, brother. Because, I mean, if they go into the SEC year one, kick down the door, win a national title. Texas and, and the way they would recruit, they're already recruiting at a really high level, but I think it would probably translate to a top three class in 2025, just the way that I feel about it. I think it also emphasizes for them as a brand, like you are that school in the state. And they're kind of that way right now because of the fact that they made the college football playoff last year. But to build off of last year, and have a national championship banner to add to the Raptors out there in Austin. I think that would communicate a lot to recruits and say, okay, if you want to play in the biggest games, if you want to play in national championship games, you come to Texas. Again, that's the narrative then that you would be able to pitch if you get that done. Also, with all the recent coaching movement from this past offseason with Jim Harbaugh gone to the Chargers and Nick Saban retiring, I think we're kind of at a point in college football where we're almost reshuffling the deck a little bit in regards to how we view that tier one level of college football. Like, I think Georgia's probably up there. Not probably. Georgia's up there because they won two of the last three national championships, so that's worth something. Ryan Day and Ohio State probably deserve to be up there, but, like, 
the the skins on the wall aren't necessarily what you had at Michigan or what you had at Alabama. So who else is in that tier one category? I think if Texas gets it done this upcoming season and wins it all, I think you put Texas in that tier one category. And at that point, moving into the Arch Manning era in Austin, I think you operate from a massive place of power. Like Texas at that point, I think, is able to really, really lay the foundation or build on the foundation and start to build up from that foundation they've created over the course of the last couple of seasons for Steve Sarkeesian for that team in Austin. So will it happen? JJ says it's an unpopular take for him in the group chat. We appreciate him swinging his sword and shooting his shot. I think there's, there's a will and there's a way for Texas to win it all in 2024. But, of course, we'll give you our predictions when we get a little bit closer to the season. And I can't wait for that, man. Prediction time is always a fun time. And um, we're going to have some more predictions for you here before this whole thing is wrapped up during the spring season. Got more predictions. We'll have more rankings for you, too, once spring football finishes up. A lot of fun content coming on this show, coming on this channel for you here. And not... Well, really right now, but I'm saying all those things are coming in the not-too-distant future. So, moving right along here, Deion Sanders and Colorado. Anytime you're Deion Sanders, you're just going to generate headlines with whatever you say. So, we need to make sure that gets mentioned. A lot of folks say, well, you talk too much about Colorado. Hey, you, you talk too much about Travis Hunter and Shadur Sanders. And, and like, they went 4-8 and eight last year. I hear you, but I'm just telling you. We are a supply-and-demand kind of organization, supply-and-demand kind of show. And so when you tell us we want to hear more about Colorado by nature of the content you engage with, we're going to go ahead and meet your demand with some supply. So Colorado ahead of 2024, I think there needs to be a little bit of discussion with what we think about them ahead of 2024. Because Deion Sanders been in the headlines a little bit recently with what he had to say about Travis Hunter and Shadour Sanders and their potential draft destination and Shadour Sanders take an aim at the entire classification of 6A in, in the state of Texas at the high school level. Full disclaimer before we jump into this, I really like Deion Sanders. I disagree with some things that he has said over the course of the last year. I disagree with some of the things that he's done over the course of the last year. Some things raise a little bit of an eyebrow for me with what Colorado has done. But just so we're on the same page here, I love how Dion communicates with his team. I love the way that he communicates the values of his team. And I love the fact that he has pretty much done it his own way. I respect that. I respect authenticity. And Deion Sanders, if nothing else, is genuine about his approach to Colorado football. Okay? He's done it his way. And to be clear, he's done it his way, and that's the reason why he's been successful, because he's followed his own trail, because he's blazed his own path. Now, going back to what I just said, Deion Sanders, if you missed the, the clip, I'll just kind of summarize it for you, pretty much says he thinks Shadour Sanders and Travis Hunter will go somewhere between one and four, in next year's NFL draft, and he thinks one of them will be one, the other will go no further than four. Great, okay, have confidence in your guys, I'm all about it. The question was directly asked to him, too, where are they going in the draft? So he didn't steer the conversation that way. However, he also said there's certain cities now where it's not going to happen. He said it's going to be an Eli if they get drafted to a certain team. He's, of course, referring to Eli Manning getting drafted by the Chargers and saying pretty much like, hey, I'm not going to go play for you, I'm going somewhere else. It all worked out for everybody. Chargers got Phillip Rivers. Eli Manning went to the Giants. It worked out. But the bottom line here is he's saying, listen, they're not playing certain places. Okay. I mean, cool. More power to you. We'll talk about it when it gets closer to next year's draft. Whatever. Shudra Sanders makes headlines yesterday talking about how he's essentially had to face some adversity over the course of his career, saying, like, I played at a small private school in Texas. There were guys that were playing at bigger 6A schools. And he said, I don't see those guys having the same success now at their respective programs that went to those big high schools. So these generated some, some interest on the, on the Twitter sphere just because, again, the last name is Sanders, and anything that these guys say and do creates a little bit of a buzz because of who they are. Full transparency, I don't have a massive issue with either statement here. Like Deion Sanders talking about his guys not playing a certain place that's an NFL problem. We'll talk about that if you want to talk about it later. But Shadour Sanders saying, I played at a small private school. I faced adversity. While I think that's delusional that Shadour Sanders had adversity by playing at a small private school with his dad being Deion Sanders, more power to you. Like, create whatever narrative you need to create for yourself to go and compete at the highest level. And for the record, Shadour Sanders, by nature of what he did at Colorado last year, probably could have played at a 6A school and probably had a really stellar high school career like I'm not knocking that at all 
I don't agree with it, but I don't have a problem with it. Say what you want to say. Do what you want to do. Like, I'm, I'm all about it. However, the thing with me is, with Colorado assessing them ahead of 2024, I kind of treat college football teams and coaches a little bit how you would view a relationship, whether it be personal, professional. You're sort of keeping an eye out for red flags. And the more red flags that add up, the more you start to form your opinion. Remember what I said now. I'm a fan of Deion Sanders and how he operates overall. But there's a couple of things here that have raised some eyebrows. No in-home visits. That's a red flag. Everybody in college football that has been successful, i.e. Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, Ryan Day, Dabo Sweeney, like anybody that's been successful acquiring talent does in-home visits. Might be worth considering. We're looking at a book being released by Deion Sanders. More power to you. He's motivational, charismatic as it comes. Maybe it helps on the recruiting trail. Maybe it provides a little more of a awareness of who Deion Sanders is and what he does. Coach, I don't know if I want us putting out a book when we're 4-8. and eight. Just my opinion, just how I feel about it. we got coaches with really strong credentials leaving Colorado and going and taking better jobs. The reason why that's concerning, that tells me that the rest of the college football coaching public feels strongly that your coaches that are leaving your organization are good coaches and they're getting jobs. Like your, your offensive coordinator went and got a head coaching job. Your defensive coordinator went and got a job in the SEC on the defensive side of the ball. Like there's a little bit of concern there for me that the way that Deion Sanders and the way that these coaches are not fitting at Colorado, but they have a really strong approval rating somewhere else, Sets off an alarm. Hey, why are coaches leaving your program? I don't love that. Last one signed eight recruits in 2024. Number 66 ranked class. I get it. You're going to the portal. I get it. There's a numbers game that has to be had there. But like, hey, we got to we gotta maybe ramp it up a little bit there. So the red flags here are starting to add up for me when it comes to Deion Sanders and when it comes to Colorado. So I was on Snaps yesterday with Aaron Murray, who does an awesome job on that show part of the volume, go check it out. They do great work, him and T-Bob Bear. But he asked me this question. He said, do you, think, do you think Deion Sanders is losing focus? And this is relation or in relation to the question around his uh, son in the NFL draft and Travis Hunter in the NFL draft. And I thought about it for a second, and I don't think I'm worried about Deion Sanders losing focus. My concern here is we're, is we're focusing on the wrong things. My concern here is we're focusing so much on the external and the brand and, you know, all the things that have to do with Coach Prime and Colorado and all those things. And I think those are good things, just so we're on the record. I think those are good things to build your brand and to have an awareness of who you are when it comes to the college football landscape, to be a good salesman to some degree. I think that's a non-negotiable, and I think a lot of coaches would do well to take a page or two out of Dion's playbook in that sense. But again, the concern is, we're not focusing enough on some of the things that maybe we should be focusing on. The guys that we should be signing, maybe at the high school level. The guys that maybe we should be landing when it comes to the transfer portal. Don't hear a lot about football stuff. Don't hear a lot about the, the inner workings of Colorado from a strategy standpoint, from a staff standpoint. Like, I love the way that they've acquired, you know, Deion, San or Deion Sanders has you know, brought his son, who's a big-time quarterback, who got Jordan Seaton at the high school level, which is a massive get for them. But, like, it's kind of these one-offs where college football isn't a thing where you can just grab one or two guys and change the entire complexion of your football team, especially not when your base for that is a 4-8 and eight season. So the more I look at this thing, I'm like, all right, I don't think we're not focused, period. I think we're focusing maybe a little bit on some things that maybe won't provide the exact return that we're looking for when it comes to that investment. So I also want to make sure we say this before we move on. I've said it many times. If anyone can turn the tide on a positive and squeeze that positive for all the juice that it's worth and then some, it's Deion Sanders. Case in point is last year. We've said it many times. We'll say it one more time. Deion Sanders in Colorado had college game day come to town for a game against Colorado State, a G5 team. A rival nonetheless, but they were supposed to wax Colorado State. Now, they won the game. I'm not here to talk about the game. I'm here to talk about they took an a undefeated start and parlayed it into national exposure. So, Deion Sanders and company, I think 4-8, and eight, just so we're on the same page here, last year, I think that was a solid season. I really do. I think 4-8 and eight was a good year. Look to the future, though. We go 4-8 and eight again. 
all right, maybe the, the momentum starts to dial back a little bit. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope Deion Sanders and company crush it. I hope they go and win more than six ball games. I hope they're in a bowl game. I love Deion Sanders for college football. I think it's phenomenal. I love the way that he motivates his team, but there's multiple red flags here that concern me, and the things that are being talked about right now that aren't super football-centric, those concern me a little bit more as well. So I, I hope he succeeds. I really do. I hope that we're on the same page here, that I, I am a Dion fan, but a couple of thoughts ahead of 2024 for Colorado. No issues with what's being said right now. No issues with Shadour saying he played at a small school. I love that. No issue with Deion Sanders talking about his guys and their future in the NFL. They should probably be high draft picks. But I'm a little bit concerned about some of these red flags that we've seen over the course of the last year out there in Colorado. But the beautiful part about it, y'all, we get to settle it on the football field. That's what I love so much about football, man. There is nothing left to speculation when that confetti drops on whoever the national champion is and whenever bowl season finishes up. Now, speaking of actually having games played, we're not in that part of the year right now. We're going to get spring games played soon. Ohio State going to have their spring game nationally televised with Joel Klatt and Co. on the call. Absolutely love that. We moved in this part of the year, though, called uh, spring propaganda season, if you will. It's college football junkie season still, but spring propaganda is running rampant. And there's a lot of folks now that hear propaganda and they say, oh, that's a bad thing. Hey, propaganda, stay away. We don't want spring propaganda. We fall on the exact opposite side of that fence when it comes to that train of thought. Or like, hey, it's spring ball. If you don't win spring ball as a fan, that's on you. You should be a national champion in your mind every single spring. You want to know why? Because there's been zero games played. It's only practice. And it's only off of the buzz and the message boards and the intel that you're hearing. So that's why we say, hey, spring propaganda, baby. Bring it on. Bring us some more of that. So that led me to ask the question here. What is your favorite spring propaganda that you like to partake in. A couple of these that I'm a big fan of. The social snippet from practice. Oklahoma dropped a banger yesterday. Jackson Arnold did a team period on the run. Throws a frozen rope for a touchdown to his guy. And I'm like, man, pass that Jackson Arnold Kool-Aid this way, baby. I'm, I'm buying stock in Jackson Arnold this spring. You want to know why? Because you just get a little bit of a glimpse of the highlight. And that's where we get to form our entire opinion on what they're going to be in the fall. As a college football fan. I love it. Social snippet, spring propaganda, chef's kiss. In that same vein, when it comes to buzz around your program, I have never once heard of a quarterback behind closed doors during the early part of spring practice that we're in right now that's not absolutely spinning it. Not just, I mean, just RPMs on the ball, and this is what you hear. Hey, he looks good. <laughs> I, I love this propaganda. He looks good. He looks more confident. He looks more poised. He's in control of the offense, vocal leader light years ahead of where he was last year. Just totally disregard what happened last year. Totally disregard what they didn't do on the field last year. Totally disregard the fact that they threw more interceptions than touchdowns. Hey, he's more comfortable. He's more in his own skin right now, knowing he's the guy. He's spinning it. Spring propaganda, your quarterback spinning it. I absolutely love that. This is one that Trey Anity and I talked about before the show, which I thought he was on the money. The spring propaganda around the early enrollees is nothing short of phenomenal. Like the, hey, he's supposed to be at prom right now. He's here during the spring game. He's, he's practicing with the guys. And then on top of that, saying, well, hey, he's going to be special. He's different. <laughs> he's, he's figured out the playbook so quickly, man. Like he's going to be a dude for you day one. Now, some of that is true. I think by that propaganda when it comes to Jeremiah Smith and Cam Coleman. But nonetheless, man, soak it in. Enjoy it. You don't get to take any Kool-Aid into the fall with you. Drink it all during the spring. The early enrollee propaganda, second to none. The five stars already on campus. Hey, you can tell he's different, man. He's different. He's got, a, he's got a different way of moving about him. He's got a different different buzz around him when you see him on the field. He's an alpha. I love that. I love that so much. The assistant coach, that's a game changer for you. You hear this every year with the new staff. Hey, he, he walks out on the pitch, man. On the pitch. I hate that so much. I just said that. Uh, I'm watching the David Beckham documentary right now. He walks out on the field. Does the new assistant coach. And he just, he changes the game, man. He, you can tell he knows how to talk to the players. He's going to raise that position, group, that, that position group so much. And there's also always somehow baked in the fact that this new assistant coach is going to call plays somehow. Like, you didn't hire him to be the OC or the DC, but it's always the, oh, yeah, he'll, he'll have influence on play calling. Really? He's a wide receivers coach. Yeah, he's going to have influence on the play calling, though. I mean, he's just it, – it, also, it's always the, well, we're going to have him for one year because he's going to be a head coach next year. He's going to be a coordinator next year. There's no way we keep him for another year. I love that, dude. I absolutely love that propaganda. The last one here I want to get to, 
the they look different propaganda. Hey, these guys have added 10, 15 pounds of muscle, man. It's a different looking football team. I know they're out there in shorts and just jerseys and helmets, but like they, they're a different looking football team. They're, they're ready for this gauntlet of a schedule. This is not actually untrue because during spring football, you're seeing these guys right after they finish winter conditioning and the goal for winter conditioning in most circles is to put on muscle mass that you're then assume you're going to lose some of that weight during the course of that, sp- of that 15 spring practices. When I was at Baylor, the goal for us, if we were trying to get to a certain weight, for me at least, it was gain a pound a week. Y'all, I've never been so heavy by the time fall practice started. I promise you I did look different. So the they look different propaganda, second to none. All these are second to none, which doesn't really make sense, but nonetheless, spring propaganda. It's that time of year, man. Enjoy it. Soak it in. Do not lose the spring season in your mind. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. Win spring. Buy the propaganda. Drink the Kool-Aid. You can't take it with you. Can't take it with you, man. No other way around it. Hey, listen, we're under uh, some time constraints today. So with that being the case, Q&A will be back tomorrow. Nick Bragg is on the ones and twos today, baby. It's a good deal to have him back. You don't get to see him today, but you get to see him tomorrow. And that alone is reason for you to come back. All right. Hey, we love y'all. I keep saying it, man, and I never get tired of saying it. We're grateful that y'all allow us to do this show for a living. We appreciate y'all. We love y'all. Drink the Kool-Aid. Buy the propaganda. Tell us who you think is under pressure in the 2024 season. I'll tell you what, we'll meet back here same time tomorrow. You're on podcast. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. Rate, review, all that good stuff. We're going to keep this party rolling, and we will see y'all next time.